Hello. At least the film guys are still here this time. Last time I spoke at Monkey Grow, they had gone home by the time I got on, so... <laughs> he invites me and then, you know... Anyway, um, hello. I'm going to try and get through this as quickly as I can, and I promise at the end, if you stay and listen, I've got some videos of people using stuff, which is usually kind of... I don't know how many of you guys have actually seen much usability testing. Anybody seen any usability testing? That's, that's not bad, that's not bad. You don't usually get to see other people's stuff, but because uh, I work at GDS and because a lot of our stuff is open and shareable, I can show you some of our stuff. I, would, I don't want to give you the whole, what does that mean? Oh, the sound, yes, thank you. Good tip. I won't give you the whole spiel because probably you've sat through GDS presentations before. Um, or you'll have the pleasure of doing it at a time when there is more time in the future, no doubt. But um, the, the, the crux of it really is that we're trying to make stuff that's good enough that people will choose to do it online rather than all of the other many more expensive ways and, and probably less good ways of, of completing tasks of interacting with the government. Um, people know this one the most, I think. WK was like kind of like our first album, um, and it, it went quite well. Um, but there is a bunch of other stuff going on as well. So there's My Baby, which is the Identity Assurance Project, uh, which is an interesting one. Um, Emily is here and working on changing the way that hardware works, like just basically technology and government works, which is like a massive and incredibly important project. There's lots of stuff being done, uh, measuring, making sure that the stuff that we're doing is actually effective, is actually making a difference, is actually improving the things that we want it to improve. There's a huge project called the Transformation Project, which is going and looking at 25 of the most significant transactions that you can do with government at the moment and, and fixing those, so working out in all of the departments. So there's, there's a lot more going on than just looking after the Gov UK website. And whenever we talk about this stuff, we're kind of endlessly going users, 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 user needs, user needs, user needs, all the time, users, users, users. We have design principles that start with users, and it's all about user, user, user. When we talk about how we do agile, it's all user, 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 user. For me, this is good because this is my line of work. Um, um, what, what I've been working really hard at over the last six to 12 months, basically, is to try to make us better at, at really getting the user thing right. And this has involved understanding how to do user research in agile projects at, at a reasonably large scale, which if you've done any agile projects with user research, even just doing it like in one project with one researcher can be pretty hard. Doing it with a couple of dozen researchers, or if you count all of the departments now, many dozen researchers in a way that's kind of useful and effective and uh, it's just it's, it's a bit of a challenge so if you go back to May last year this is kind of what the research team looked like we had four kind of consultancy researchers who were the research team they all sat together on the floor somewhere and people from throughout GDS and different departments throughout government would like email them and say we've got some icons can you test them and see if they work which is a user the research is kind of like worst nightmare because it's, it's just it's, it's a horrible brief. And then there was me, uh, a guy called Stephen Dunn, who is the product owner for the Identity Assurance Project. Um, that f funny how these things happen. They kind of have their own budget, so he can hire people the, the way that he wants to. So he hired me to go and work on identity. So I was the only researcher in the identity village, but I also only had one project, unlike the other guys who had about 52 projects each. Uh, so you can imagine how effective they were. And by contrast, I was able to be a lot more effective because I was embedded in with my team and I could really get to know the problem that I was working on well. And also, more importantly, <laughs> I was working with teams of people who hadn't really worked with a researcher before. They, did, they didn't really know what I did or what to expect me to do or how I could help, what conversations to involve me and what parts of the process I could contribute to, all of that kind of thing. But by being there with them all the time, they could learn how to use me and I could learn how to work with them better and we could do better work and start solving a pretty challenging problem. Uh, set of problems uh, re more quickly than it happened kind of in the four years leading up to there. So, so, so that, that was effective, and we thought, let's learn from that. And so now, 
this is where you find the research team is in the project team. So I am no longer the exception. I am now the, the rule. Or from a kind of a, an agile perspective, we've turned from like a coop of chickens into a lot of pigs. <laughs> um, I'm going to assume that you, that you know the breakfast analogy for Agile, and if you don't, you should. Um, so so, so this, this means, I think, that we're doing like massively better work than we were able to before, partly because we're allowed to really engage with projects, and partly because by being there with the teams, they're able to understand how to work with us better, and we're able to understand how to work with them better, and we can all just do much better work together. And as a result of that, we don't have four incredibly stretched researchers who are desperately trying to do the, the little that they can across all of the different projects that they have. We've now got dozens of researchers um, in you know, working across all of those different projects that I described before. And whereas before there were virtually none of us in departments, we're now getting more and more people in departments as well because we've found a way to work really well with the teams on these projects. Um, Really quickly, in case you've got absolutely no idea what a user researcher does, does we try to um, actually understand really what user needs are that aren't uh, evident from analytics. So uh, in a lot of organizations, including GDS, the starting place for understanding user needs a lot of the time is looking at the analytics, looking at the behaviors that are already there from the, the, the web properties that you can that already exist, um, which is a very good place to start. However, it doesn't give you a complete picture, and it can sometimes give you a misleading picture, depending on how you interpret that data. So we go out and actually <laughs> talk to the users, get in, in the context of use, and, and really make sure that we do have the complete picture and that we've framed the needs correctly. So we understand the context. We understand you know, what mental models are they bringing in when they're, when they're looking at a task. How does this task relate to all of the other tasks? When they do this, do they have heaps of time or are they absolutely stretching out? Um, how does what works well and what doesn't work well in the interface relate to the, the broader policy challenges as well and the whole of the entire service? So not just thinking about digital, but you know the, the interaction with phone and post and, and in person and all the different things. Um, that's something that if you're working on a digital team reliant just on analytics, you're not going to get that big picture. And it does have a significant impact on your ability to create good digital services. So we do that and then we, we work with the team to evaluate and to iterate the design solution. So we're constantly taking prototypes or real services out to people, showing them alternatives, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't, and bringing the feedback back in and reworking that. On the project that I'm in now, I think we're on about iteration 32. So 32 times we've taken stuff out, um, either stuff that we're trying to improve or just random ideas that we've had or what might work or what might not work. Um, and, and we've taken some pretty rubbish stuff out, but we've learned a lot from it and we've moved a long way. Um, and most of this we do by, by observing and, and talking to people. And we might do that in labs, we might do that in job centers, we might do that in libraries, we might do that in their homes. We could, there's, you know, there's no stopping us, basically. We will harass people anywhere. Um, <laughs> well, um, yeah, I'm still getting used to that. Um, we do things like we'll do interviewing, we'll, we'll do journey mapping. So this is an example of an artifact from uh, somebody journey mapping their experience of hiring their first employee, which is an interesting process to go through, as some of you would know. Uh, we, and we do you know, old, school, old school usability testing as well. So there's a whole raft of different activities. That's just a really small selection of them. And one of the things that we do that I think is incredibly important is that we, we analyze our research in a really open and collaborative way. So this is literally a photograph of a, of a research analysis session that we've done where the yellow post-it notes are insights, things that we saw or things that people said throughout the research sessions. And then the pink ones are, are our insights. What do we think that this means? And then the orange things are the actions. What are we gonna do about it? Because one of the big problems that you have with researchers is lots of great insights and interesting stories and very little done about it. And if you go to uh, a conference of ethnographers, you, you can feel the angst of these people who have gone out and learned such interesting things and nobody's ever done anything about it. And they are, you know, they, they, are, they are a mournful crew with great stories. Um, and so we really, we, we don't want to be those guys and we go to the EPIC conference, which is what the ethnographers conference is called, and we tell them about how our stuff gets into products and they are so jealous, even if we are the government. <coughs> so how, how, how do we get to this point where we have 
all of these researchers running around doing hopefully fairly useful research where before there was virtually none and not really a huge appetite for it either, I would say. I think one of the main things that, that really helped was, was setting out a structure. So actually saying, this is, the, this is what these people should be doing and how you should be using it and what you can expect to see if you've got one in your team. And we used a probably not very unfamiliar model to talk about how we would structure our time and activities. I'm going to assume that you've seen this all before. And we would do really simple things like say, we do testing on Tuesdays. Alliteration helps. Testing Tuesdays is like a thing. Um, and so, you know, we sort of work out if we've got a sprint of two weeks, that Tuesday is a testing Tuesday. We spend a bunch of time making prototypes beforehand, and then on testing Tuesday, we go into the lab and do some testing. And then the next day, on Wednesday, that's our analysis day, we go and do the analysis. And then, you know, the, the, on, by Wednesday afternoon, the actions are in the backlog, ready for sprint planning, and, and off we go again. Uh, and there's something about the fact that it's just very predictable and understandable. People know where they'll find you and what you're going to be doing and how what you're doing fits into what they're doing. Uh, it, makes it, kind of, it makes it an easy product to buy, in a way, which is kind of good. We've written all of this up into the service design manual, which is available online. And that, then, is something that people in departments can point to and go, we need to do that thing. Um, and then the whole cycle continues. One of the other things is sharing the responsibility. So I think one of the reasons that the guys at the Epic conference get so depressed is that they get to go out and do all of the amazing stuff, um, and they, they don't bring their team with them. So we are saying this all the time. It's not up to us to go out and gather the insights and come back and preach it. It's up to us to facilitate opportunities for everybody in our team to see what it's like to be an end user, what it's like for an end user to be grappling with the concept that you're trying to get them to understand or the form that you're trying to get them to fill in. Um, and, and we really want to try and make this kind of user experience thing not a job title that you can point to somebody in the corner and say, that person is the UX person. So as James said, you know, if, the, if there's something wrong, it's my fault. Well, well no, because it's, it's, a whole, it's a whole team thing. So you know, we've, we have a research team and we have a design team. We don't have people who are called UX people. And we don't do UX. We do user-centered design. And I think these kind, of, these kind of words are actually really important, um, even if it means that kind of everybody in the UX industry thinks that we're wrong. We think they're all wrong. And it's really important because some of the biggest challenges that we have to face from a UX perspective are not interface design or even kind of clear, plain language issues. They're policy issues. When we go out, the things that tend to make people cry, and they do, tend to be policy things, not... You don't, you, well, you, you might argue, once I show you this video later, you don't cry about a drop-down. You cry about the fact that when your child goes into hospital, you're no longer entitled for carer's allowance. This is, we can't, we cannot iterate that away through interface design. So it's everybody's job to do UX, not just ours. Um, and then another thing that seems to work quite well is to kind of set these benchmarks that are measurable and attainable and you, you, you can feel like you're ticking a box if you're doing it well. So we, we aim for a couple of specific goals, which is we talk about everybody in the team from, from the top all the way down should be observing at least two hours of, of research every six weeks. And this comes from research that was done by uh, Jared Spool's team, UIE, in the States, uh, and they went out to try to understand what makes some organizations better at making good products and services than others, what makes the difference, and they looked at you know, how much money people spend, how much time they take, took, what kind of methodology they used, how many designers they had, how good the designers were, all, all of the kinds of things that you would think might make a difference. And the thing that they discovered really made the most significant difference was whether or not people in the organization actually got to spend time with their end users on a regular basis. And this seemed to be the amount of time at, at which it became significant, which if you've ever worked in retail makes perfect sense, right? Because good retailers walk, walk the shop floor. They look around and they see what displays are working well and what products are selling well, and who's being, you know, which of the staff are particularly good with customers, and, and they, they change their, their setup depending on that feedback on a really sort of regular basis. Um, we don't have shops so much anymore, especially if you're doing digital stuff. You know, how do you, how do you walk the shop floor? I, I think that that's the role that, that user research plays, is to help facilitate the opportunities for product teams in the digital space, in, in the non-retail space, to, to kind of virtually walk the shop floor, if you know what I mean. 
Um, so that means then, you know, we, we work in two-week sprints in a lot of the projects, one-week sprints for the ones that are real pain seekers. Um, we try to get a, at least a round of research in every two-week sprint, um, which if you're not used to doing research, you know, most companies will do it maybe once every quarter, once they feel good if they're doing it once every quarter, once every six months is, you know, still, still pretty good. We feel like every two weeks is fairly generous, actually, and sometimes in the, in the off week, we're like, yeah, maybe let's, let's do a quick quant study or something like that. We've got a bit of time on our hands. Um, having said that, every week is, is kind of unsustainable. You get pretty tired. Um, the, probably the most important thing, though, is, is this thing, which, um, which we've sort of got there, all of our new stickers. Strategy is delivery, or, you know, as I always say, I, I just actually get shit done. That's something that researchers are not really well known for, helping get shit done. So it's really been very important for us to be seen to be able to deliver useful stuff very quickly. And that guides all of the planning and all of the design that we do around how we undertake research. We get to learn some really interesting things about people, I think. Um, and because we do lots of work across lots of different projects now, we can kind of compare what we find so that if we just get one random person over there that does something kind of kooky, um, we, by, by triangulating that with all of the other studies as well, we can go, huh, there actually could be something sort of significantly interesting here. We, it's our job to try and design um, services that are able to be used by anybody who wants to use the internet, basically. So that means when we see something like this, it's fairly important. Why doesn't it say that? If you just click on the 26, on the drop down. So if you, go, if you click on the arrow. Stop. Okay. Yeah, just click on the, click on the date. And you're going to click on the month. If you just click on it. What do you mean? I did click on Click on, it. click on May. It's gone back to month. Let's click on it. Clicking on it. Looking at home. Click on it. This is why I don't do this at work at home. You've got to do different. Oh, night to the 17 of I. Right. So. So that's, that, that's kind of funny in a way, but also that woman's 31 years old. She's well educated. She works in an office. We have, we have programs that we call like assisted digital, for who are just designed, you know, our, our mantra is digital by default, right? So assisted digital for those people who are, who are not able to, for whatever reason, use the internet. She's not that person. Thing is, if you do three text boxes for date, month, year, she would have got through that absolutely fine. Um, and this is something that we, we see a, a lot of, right? And drop downs, you know, drop down, big deal. But, but, but this, and, and that's just one video. I could show you dozens of people kind of really having exactly the same issues. Passwords, I think, I think we, all, we all know, you know, that one, two, three, four, five, six, lots of people apparently think is an awesome, awesome password. Um, and you can look at those lists of, you know, the, the crazy things that people do. But for me, it's really interesting to kind of make sure that we maintain empathy and understanding as to, you know, what, what of, why do people do this, and what are they thinking, and what, what's it really like to be them, rather than um, just look at the list, basically. What do you like with passwords? Do you, do you tend to make... What, was, what does that look like? <laughs> that means I use, very often use the same ones. Yeah. I tend to stick to his name, your name, the combination of both, or the animals. How do you keep track of it all? Uh, write it all down. Oh, really? You keep it at home somewhere. When I wrote it, it was a in a book. So, you know, sometimes I... Well, I used, tend to use the same, similar passwords for most things. It's like, OK, which one did I use? My one, his one. The dog, the dog, the cat, the cat, the cat. And it's like, oh, I can't remember. So I try and have a um, uh, sort of serious password, a social password, and then... A, did you say a serious? Yeah, sort of like a banking password, yeah. sort of money. Yeah, serious things like money and that, or yeah. then a social one, and then maybe a shopping. I don't just put Ellie, mm. 
Zero one, mm. my dog. Good, because now I always have a password. Yeah. You know, if I was going to do it, and funny enough, I don't use Ellie, mm. but if I was, it would be Ellie Woofer. Oh, oh one, or yeah, yeah. Um, Ellsworth, because mm. that's one of the things a friend of mine. So that's like sophisticated password. I don't use Ellie, I use Ellie Woofer. Um, and I use it for everything because it's so tricky that nobody would ever be able to guess that, that that's what it is. Um, I've, we've asked people the question about how they do their password, I think probably about three or 400 times this year. Um, and I've not met one person who's ever even heard of a password management software. You know, and, and it's just, it's, I, I, find it, I find it really distressing that, um, that there are people who really think that their behavior is actually really secure when it's exactly the complete antithesis to that. Um, so that, that, they're kind of a few sort of poignant pausing for thought things. But I just wanted to sort of end on what I think is kind of a little bit of a high note because what, we've, what, we, what, what we know, what we should all kind of know is that if you do keep going out and doing this, if you keep putting the users properly at the center of, of, of your project and, and giving them the opportunity to shape the way that you design it, then you can get to good outcomes. What was your overall impression of that bit compared to... Shorter. Shorter than the online? Much easier. Okay. Much easier. A little bit dubious there with the, just that one question. That is easy peasy. I can't believe how easy it is because I thought, oh my gosh, we'll be here for two hours because I don't know how long they are, but I can't believe it. Really, I can't believe. And I'm trying to... And I'm thinking back and I'm thinking, well, yeah, they have. They've got all the information that they need, all the information that they need. So that's how long it should be, really. But it's amazing how short that is. Okay, yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Well, I'm pleased with that. You don't hear that every day from people who are trying to apply for carer's allowance. So that's what we're up to.